Before the service, um, I, I went up to a couple of people standing in the back and I said, this is just going to be a good Sunday. Um, I, you could just feel it again this morning. You could just feel the closeness, the love among brothers and sisters. And I hope that you all feel that. And I really feel good. I hope you feel good at the end of the message as I do at the beginning of the message. But it's like, I just think God wants to speak through us through his word again this morning. Um, I personally am loving looking at the Bible as one story, God's continuing story of his love for his people. I've never read the Bible in chronological order like we're doing here for 20 weeks with the Old Testament. And I'm learning a lot from it in looking at it this way. Because what I see every time I'm looking at it and studying it, it's just how it just continues to point forward. Everything we look at just makes so much more sense when you look at it in chronological order and that it just continues to point forward to Christ. So I hope that you get a sense of that again this morning as we look at God's Word. Last week, um, well, for those of you who are visiting and wondering what on earth I'm talking about, we're looking at the Bible. Um, it is actually printed in chronological order in a book called The Story, but it is God's story in complete order, chronological order, timeline, etc. And uh, we're doing 20 weeks Old Testament, 12 weeks New Testament. The New Testament portion we're doing this fall. I am amazed at what God is doing outside of the walls of this church through this series. Um, in the last five weeks, and I want to say good morning to all of these people, but there's over 400 people who are watching this. And I think that's pretty cool. Through the internet that will pick up this service, there's been about over 400 people so far. There's some people joining us this morning, a community at UCLA in California, and there's other people in Venezuela. And it's like, what is God doing with this? This little church, but a powerful message. It's not my message, it's not my story, but it's God's story. And I hope that you're getting a sense of how big our God is. And in my prayer before, when I said what's happening beyond this church, God is using his word and tools today Sometimes we look at the destructive power of the internet, but when you look at the potential and the awesome ability to communicate God's word, I'm excited for the future and what God has in store for his people. I don't know where God's going to use all of that, but I want to pray to him this morning. Let's take a minute, let's pray for our message this morning, and let's pray for those people who are beyond our walls that are going to be impacted by this as well. Join me in prayer. Father God, we want to give you thanks for giving us an opportunity to open up your word. Lord, again this morning, I pray that you would speak much louder than me, that I might step out of the way, and that you would be heard, that you would touch each of us where we're at, and that we could leave here this morning, not only with challenges before us, but as people who are changed in some way. So just meet, meet us where we're at, speak to us wherever we're at, whether it's here in Byron Center, whether it's in California, whether it's in Venezuela, wherever we are, Lord, use this time to build us and build your kingdom. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we, uh, we left off with Moses at Mount Sinai. Um, just a very brief recap on that. Moses had been up and down the mountain several times. He had these incredible encounters with God. We talked about the mountains trembling and shaking, the fire, the smoke, um, kind of scary. The people at the bottom said, Moses, you talk to us. We, we don't want God to speak to us this way. I mean, it was a frightening time, but it was a time in which they undoubtedly knew that God had spoken to them. And how many times didn't Israel say, uh, you know, we knew how... how they were stiff-necked, stubborn, um, disobedient people in so many ways, but yet every time God called them back to task and Moses called them back to order, they said, we will obey all the commands. Remember that? How many times didn't Israel say that? We'll obey all the commands. We'll do whatever you say you want us to do. Well, at Mount Sinai, in those trips up and down the mountain, Moses was given the Ten Commandments, wasn't he? The first tablet, when he came down, he smashed because there were the golden calves. They said they would obey, and then the 40 days on the mountain that comes down, and the Israelites had made a golden calf that they were worshiping. And we talked about how God didn't tolerate that type of sin. 
Yet Israel knew that God had delivered them from Pharaoh. I mean, he had delivered them from slavery. Um, He had delivered them through the Red Sea. And yet they continued to be disobedient. They obeyed, they didn't obey. Well, it wasn't too long after God had given them the Ten Commandments. So we're at Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments. And they said they're going to obey. They're going to do everything they commanded. And then they, they built the calf. And then some time passes. And um, the bottom line is we're at the point of Mount Sinai now. And you can go back and look at some of those things. But we're at Mount Sinai and Israel's ready to move. The Israelites are ready to move. They've got the ark with them. And the ark contains the two tablets of stone. It contains the covenant. The constant reminder that's going to go with them of how they're to live right? It's like taking your Bible with you everywhere you go as a reminder of how you're supposed to live. And they have the tent of meeting. This is the place where God's presence dwelled. The tent of meeting would travel with them. Now, if you're unfamiliar with that story, I really want to encourage you to go back to Exodus and look at some of that because it's an awesome story that gives a picture of how Israel was to worship, how God gave them specific instructions on the Articles and the way that they should worship. They're ready to leave Mount Sinai. That's where we're at this morning. In a crass way, they're on the road again. They're ready to move out. This has been a long journey. But this time, it's different. This time, they're on the way to the promised land. It's kind of like the final leg of the journey, if you will. I don't know how many of you have ever driven to Florida, but if you drive, I'm just taking Florida or wherever, if it's California, wherever you're going. But a long journey to the other end, the destination, way at the other end of where you're headed, and you get to the Florida state line and it says, welcome to Florida. Isn't that a pleasant sight? Yeah, but we're not there yet. You probably still have at least another six hours before you get to Bradenton or whatever Dutch colony of vacationing in Florida you want to get to, okay? You're not there yet, but you can see it. You can begin to see it. I think Israel could begin to see the promised land. They've been waiting. They've been wanting to go. Kind of like coming back from Florida and you get to Michigan. It says pure Michigan. And you hit the snow and everything else, but you're not home yet. But you can see it. You get a taste of it. You get a feel for it. We're almost there, but not there yet. I want to pick up the story, and we'll look at Numbers chapter 10, verses 11 and 12. This is where they're at. It says, in the second year after Israel's departure from Egypt, puts a little framework around it, on the 20th day of the second month, the cloud lifted from the tabernacle of the covenant. Now remember, there was a cloud that they traveled by, In the daytime, the presence of God went before them in the daytime with a pillar of cloud. And at nighttime, there was a pillar of fire, the presence of God for their movement. It says, so the Israelites set out from the wilderness of Sinai. That's where the mount was, where they got the Ten Commandments. And it says, and traveled on from place to place until the cloud stopped in the wilderness of Paran. Now, I want you to think with me for a minute. You would have thought that the Israelites would have absolute, total confidence and trust in God. The God who delivered them from the slavery, delivered them from Pharaoh, brought them through how many different battles, did how many different miracles along the way. The God who brought them through the water, parted the sea, brought them through on the other side, and they watched Pharaoh and his army get drowned, if you will, when the waters came back down. You would have thought they would have total faith. But the Israelites continued to complain and blame God for the difficulties and the hardships that they faced. They complained so much, in fact, at this point, that God's anger burned, the Bible tells us. He even sent down fire among them. They were complaining about having no food. They were sick of manna. In Egypt, they said, at least we had fish and fruits and vegetables. They wanted real food. If there were an Arby's there, they wanted the meat. They wanted real food. Moses heard their grumbling. He knew God was angry. And Moses says to God, where can I get meat for these people? And Moses says, God, if this is how you're going to treat me, if these people are going to keep grumbling and there's no meat, just go ahead and kill me. 
Moses has been their leader for how many years? And Moses is, basically, if you can picture Moses, Moses is saying, I can't deal with these people anymore, Lord. No matter what you do, they don't seem to get it. And I can't lead them anymore. I can't take this anymore. I can't deal with their grumbling and complaining. And if you're not going to do something here, just, just kill me. Just get rid of me because I feel like I'm of no use, Moses says. I can't carry them any longer. But, he says, if I've found favor in your eyes, don't let me be ruined. Then the Lord says to Moses, again, and we heard this last week, he says, tell the people to consecrate themselves. In other words, get ready for something big. Something holy is going to happen. Tell them to consecrate themselves. For tomorrow, they will have meat, the Bible says. In fact, not just meat for a day or a week, but meat for a month. They want meat, I'll give them meat. Matter of fact, they'll have so much meat that they'll have meat coming out of their nostrils. Now there's a sight. They're going to puke it out of their nostrils. That's what it's saying. They're going to be sick of meat. He says, they're going to loathe it, they're going to oppose it. They'll be so sick of it. Listen to the account of the story. Numbers eleven twenty one says, But Moses responded to the Lord, There are 600,000 foot soldiers here with me, and yet you say, I will give them meat for a whole month? Even if we butchered all our flocks and all our herds, what would that satisfy them? Even if we caught all the fish in the sea, would that be enough? Then the Lord said to Moses, and you, I want you to underline this or circle it if you're in your Bibles or on your tablets, has my arm lost its power? In other words, Moses, is there anything too big for me? Is there anything too big for the Lord? Has my arm lost its power? Now you will see whether or not my word comes true. You go forward just a few verses. It says, now the Lord said, this is in verse 31, now the Lord sent a wind that brought quail from the sea and let them fall around the camp. For miles in every direction there were quail flying about three feet above the ground. So the people went out and caught quail all that day and throughout the night and all the next day too. No one gathered less than 50 bushels. That's a lot of quail. They spread the quail all around the camp to dry. But while they were gorging themselves on the meat, while it was still in their mouths, the anger of the Lord blazed against the people and he struck them with a severe plague. Now some scholars think what he gave them was food poisoning. So the place was called Kibroth Hatava, which means graves of gluttony, because there they buried the people who had craved meat from Egypt. From Kibroth Hatava to the Israelites traveled to Hazareth, where they stayed for some time. Do you think they wanted more meat? They wanted meat. God gave them meat, didn't he? He gave them meat till it was coming out of their nostrils, till they were sick of it. Moses figures, okay, we can move on. The people have had their fill of meat. Some of them died because they ate so much cotton-picking meat. They're sick and they died of it. Now can we just please move on? Now Moses doesn't have problems with just the Israelites. He has problems with his family. Miriam and Aaron, his brother and sister, start speaking against him. His own family starts turning against him. And they complain to God. They said, God, how come you speak to Moses and you don't speak to us? There's a little bit of jealousy in there. Listen to these words because these are important words that God gives to Moses that point forward to the books of prophecy in the Bible. Numbers 12, starting in verse 4. Numbers 12, starting in verse 4, it says, so immediately the Lord called to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, and said, Go out to the tabernacle, all three of you. So the three of them went to the tabernacle. Then the Lord descended in the pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tabernacle. Aaron and Miriam he called, and they stepped forward. And the Lord said to them, Now listen to what I say. If there were prophets among you, I, the Lord, would reveal myself in visions. Isn't that what the prophets did in the prophecies? They shared visions. He says, I would speak to them in dreams, but not with my servant Moses. Of all of my house, he is the one I trust. 
I speak to him face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the Lord as he is. So why were you not afraid to criticize my servant Moses? The Lord was very angry with both of them, and he departed. I'm going to go through this kind of fast. But after God departed, he was angry with Miriam and Aaron. When God departed, Miriam contracted leprosy, or he gave Miriam leprosy. Her leprosy kept her confined outside of the camp for seven days. Seven days later, she's healed, okay? Now the people could move on. They had seen God again, had they not? Can we all agree? They seen God again. See what happened for disobedience. She got leprosy, but seven days later, she's healed. The whole camp could move on. Now, I want you to listen, because I think this is where the story gets really interesting. At this point, this is where the Lord says to Moses, now, when you move on, I want you to take 12 men. How many tribes were there? 12. Take one from each tribe, and I want them to go and explore the land I'm giving you. Remember I said, we're not quite there yet. We're, we're there at the state line, but we haven't crossed into the promised land. I want you to take 12 of those men and I want them to go in and look at that land. He says, I want you to check out what the land is like. He says, I want you to check out what the people are like. I want you to look at the conditions they live in. I want you to look at their cities and I want you to come back and I want you to give a report whether their cities are walled or unwalled. I want you to look at the soil. I want you to see how fertile or poor it is. I want you to look at the trees or the lack of trees. And while you're there, I want you to bring back some of the fruit of the land. It was grape season. So the 12 go in, they reach the land, they check things out, and with the, with the uh, mandate in mind to bring back some of the fruit, they cut off a single branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. I, just get a, I like grapes. I don't know about anybody else, but I love grapes. But I've never seen a cluster of grapes this big that was so big that two of them had to carry it on a pole. That's a lot of grapes, especially when they're $2.99 a pound. But they're so big. This is an awesome land. I mean, even the grapes are huge. And they brought along some pomegranates and figs. And at the end of 40 days, and we always see the 40 days in the Bible, don't we? After the 40 days, they return from exploring the land. And this is the report they give. Numbers 13, starting in 27. This was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore, and it is indeed a beautiful country a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it produces. But the people living there are powerful, and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, descendants of Anak. The Amalekites live in the Negev, and the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan Valley. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go back at once and take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. But the other men who explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. So, the, so they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we travel through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought too. Move forward to chapter 14 and what's the caption over the top of the text? The people rebel. When the whole community began weeping aloud and they cried all night, their voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in Egypt or if even here in the wilderness, they complained. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down on the ground before the whole community of Israel. Two of the men who had explored the land, Joshua son of Nun and Caleb son of Jephunneh, tore their clothing 
And they said to all of the people, the land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he'll bring us safely into that land and give it to us. It is a rich land flowing with milk and honey. Do not rebel against the Lord and don't be afraid of the people of the land. They are only helpless prey to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. Well, what do you think the Israelites wanted to do at that point? They wanted to kill Joshua. They wanted to kill Caleb because they didn't believe it. So again, Moses pleads, if you will, for the forgiveness of the behavior. But this time, the Lord says, with the exception of Caleb and Joshua, not one of you, not one of you who's over 20 years old is going to cross into that land. Do you know where they came from? Starvation up in their homeland, all the way to Egypt, now all the way down to Sinai, made the last leg of the journey. They're looking at entering the promised land, and the Lord says, only two of you are going into that land. Oh, and the children, but none of you who protest that are going in. That's like getting to the Florida line and getting almost to Bradenton and saying, you can't go to the beach. But only ten times worse. Because this is where you were going to live. This was going to be home. You get a picture of that? Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who was counted in the senseless, you will die out here in the wilderness. Now fast forward 40 years. All the people 20 years old or older at the time died. The promised land is before them. They grumbled about having no water. They're still grumbling. Even the young ones are grumbling there's no water. This time it's different with Moses. Remember before, just a couple minutes ago, how I said Moses must have been frustrated with these people because Moses said, Lord, I can't deal with them anymore. And I'm just paraphrasing. I can't deal with them anymore, Lord. You're going to have to deal with them. If you don't do something with them, just kill me. Take me out because I'm through with trying to lead them. This time, God deals with Moses. They're grumbling about having no water. The promised land before them, and Moses gets angry. Instead of raising his staff over a rock, as he was instructed, instead of lifting it up so the waters could gush out of the rock, Moses, in his anger, takes that rod and strikes the rock. Moses was mad. God still provided the water. But it's at that point where God decided that, you know what, Moses, you're not going to enter the promised land either. And neither is Aaron. Neither of you are going to enter the promised land. I think that's one of the things we need to think about, how God is upset when we get frustrated with his ways. I think I would have been like Moses. I would have been angry too. But there's great danger in getting angry like that with God because it was truly a rebellion against the command. God said, lift the rod, lift the staff for the water to flow, and Moses struck it. Talk about a letdown. From there they set out to Mount Hor. That's where Aaron dies. He didn't make it. Then they travel around the Red Sea. They go to Edom. Again, the people grumble and complain. Moses is still with them and he sends snakes. And this is important. If you look at the story, if you're reading it, it talks about how the snake, there was a plague of snakes. They bit people. The people die, right? Moses again pleads with God. And the Lord said to Moses, Numbers 21, he says, Then the Lord told him, Make a replica of a poison snake, poisonous snake and attach it to a pole. All who are bitten will live if they simply look at it. So Moses made a snake out of bronze and, uh, bronze and attached it to a pole. Then anyone who was bitten by a snake could look at the bronze snake and be healed. Do you see where that's pointing to the New Testament to Jesus? I love that. It's clearly pointing to Jesus, how Jesus would be lifted on a pole. And anybody who was bitten by sin would be healed through Jesus on a cross. What a clear picture. And I think what's even more important when you look at that is it wasn't the fact that when they 
that, that they were healed from the snake bite. It was, it was belief. It was all about faith. It wasn't that the snake healed them or that a person healed them from their sin, but it was their belief that healed them. If you look at the Israelites' journey, they continued. It was filled with battles, setbacks, disappointments, and consequences, yet they continued to make advances. What I want us to think about is so many times in those books of Exodus, in Numbers and in Deuteronomy, God talked about the land he was giving them. When I think of somebody giving somebody something or giving me something, we think of it being, oh, they're going to just give me that. God didn't just give them the land, did he? They were going to have to pay a price for what they were going to get. I think that's where we are sometimes. We just expect God to give us some things, and God says, I'm going to put you in the wilderness I'm going to have you doing some wandering. I'm going to put you through some tests and some trials to see who you really are, to see how much you really believe before he's going to give us anything. You see what I'm saying? God doesn't just give everything the way we expect it. If you haven't read the story, I want you to pick up a copy of it and pick up with this chapter. There's a lot more that we're, we could cover that I'm not going to cover. But what I want to do in bringing this to a close is this. Remember when Moses was called? Moses said, I can't do it, Lord, because I can't speak. The man who couldn't speak delivered three incredible speeches that I think are incredibly relevant for us this morning. I want us to look at them, and I want us to look at the map before I read the text. I want you to picture, and it's maybe a little hard to read, but up in the land of Goshen, the Egypt area, there you go, thank you. This is the area where they're held in slavery. Israel makes their journey across the water, and they come all the way down to the bottom of Mount Sinai, Way at the bottom of Mount Sinai. Well, yeah, that's, that's wilderness of Sinai. Yep, Mount Sinai is way at the bottom. Then they start heading back up. We talked about Kadesh Barnea. They come across to Ezon Geber, and then they go all the way up to Heshbon. And if you see the Salt Sea, the Dead Sea, just above it is the River Jordan, just to the north. And to the west of that's the Promised Land. Moses is to the east of the Jordan River, the people haven't crossed. Moses is told, Moses, you're going to die here. You're not going to get to cross the Jordan. But if you can picture Moses looking to the west and seeing the promised land and the Israelites behind him, the final leg of the journey, Moses utters these three speeches, if you will. The first is in Deuteronomy 2, verse 7. He says, the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He has watched over your journey through this vast wilderness. These 40 years, the Lord your God has blessed you and has been with you, and you have lacked nothing. Deuteronomy 6, four chapters later, starting in 12, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you get home, when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the frames of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land he swore to your forefathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large, flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you didn't dig, vineyards and olive groves you didn't plant. When you eat and you're satisfied, be careful, and you can underline this, do not forget the Lord. 
Can you just picture Moses standing there with the people giving them this speech? Look at where you've been. You've lacked nothing. God has been with you every single step of the way. I want you to never, ever forget the Lord your God, he's saying. And he knows his days are numbered. I think he spoke it with passion. In verse 13, he says, Fear the Lord your God. Don't only remember him, but fear him. Serve him only. And take your oaths in his name. Don't follow any other gods, the gods of other people around you. For the Lord your God who among you is a jealous God and his anger will burn against you and he will destroy you from the face of the land. Do not put the Lord your God to the test as you did at Massa. Be sure to keep the commands of the Lord your God and the stipulations and decrees he has given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight so that it may go well with you. In chapter 30, These words are critical. 30 verses 15 through 20. Some of the last words we're going to hear from Moses. He says, now listen. Now listen. Today I am giving you the choice between life and death. Between prosperity and disaster. For I command you this day to love the Lord your God and to keep his commands, his decrees and regulations by walking in his ways. If you do this, you will live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you and the land you are about to enter and occupy. But if your hearts turn away and you refuse to listen, and if you are drawn away to serve and worship other gods, then I warn you now that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live a long, good life in the land you are crossing, the Jordan, to occupy. Today, I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and committing yourself firmly to him. This is the key to your life. Sometimes people look at the Bible and say, I don't understand it. I don't know what there's not to understand when you look at that text. Moses was pretty clear that from there on, the people had a choice to make. The choice between life and death. Choosing God was the key to life. Shortly after this, Moses dies. The Lord shows him the land. Moses dies on the top of Mount Nebo. The Israelites still hadn't entered the promised land, but can you picture them waiting? Their leader's gone. They've got a choice to make. They can see the land. They're almost there, but not there yet. There's a lot before them, but I got to believe they're tired, they're weary. They're wandering, they're wondering, and they've got choices to make. And I thought, isn't that us? Tired. Just tired sometimes. Tired as a parent. Tired as a grandparent. Tired as a pastor, if I can be honest. Tired as a teacher. Tired as a young person, weary, wondering, maybe even wandering. Lots of choices before us and not always having the answers. Sometimes wondering, are we there yet? My hopes and dreams, am I ever going to get there? Is it ever going to happen? I take two steps forward and three steps back. Maybe even wondering if the Lord's favor is still on us. Been there? I think we've all been there. Friends, I just want to say for renewed strength for the journey and hope for tomorrow, let me encourage you to do three things. I think we find strength and hope in these texts. I'm not going to give you eight this morning. I'm going to give you three. Three that you can easily remember. And the first one is this, if we can take anything from this lesson, it is number one is remember God. 
Remember God. Remember the God who brought you through everything. The God who created you. The God who knows your name. The God who has every one of the days in your life ordained. The God who has brought you through everything, even when you didn't think he was there. He was there. I love that poem or whatever you want to call it. Footprints. I should have put it up there, but the long and the short of it is this person's walking along the beach and he's saying, God, where were you? I only see one set of footprints. And God says, that's when I carried you. God has carried us through the stuff when we thought maybe he'd abandon us. Don't ever forget God what he's brought you through, the trials, the pain, the setbacks, the tests. I truly believe that God tests us because if there were no test, how would we ever pass? Huh? How do you pass a class without having a test? What are you graded on? I think God puts tests and some of the teachers are smiling at that. Some of the tests are downright hard. But God's doing something with every one of them. You got to pass the test to pass the grade and move on. Remember how God provided in ways you could have never imagined. Remember the God who is not only with you, but the God who is for you. This whole story is nothing less than God's relentless pursuit of getting his people back into a relationship with him. Remember that life is hard, but God is good. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Number one, remember God. Number two, the words of Moses, choose God. Choose God. Don't just remember God, but choose God. There's a difference between knowing of somebody and knowing somebody, isn't there? We know of lots of people. I know who the President of the United States is. I know of him, but I don't know him. I don't have a relationship with him. I can't call him and say, hey, President Obama, this is Randy Laterbour on the other end. You say, who from where? I know of him, but I don't know him. You can remember God, but you need to choose God. That's what Moses is saying. Choose God. Because when you choose God, you choose life. See, the reality is every day, every one of us literally makes thousands of decisions. I had to make a decision this morning when the alarm went off to shut the alarm off or go back to sleep or get up and come to church. Should I brush my teeth before I have the bagel or after I have the bagel? What clothes should I wear? And hope my wife doesn't come color coordinated or we're going to look like, well, never mind. You've all seen those couples that dress alike. There's hundreds of choices we have to make every day, but the very first choice we should make when we get up is, as for me and my house, we will choose the Lord. Choose to live for God. It's the most important decision you'll make every day because when you choose God, you not only choose life, but when you choose God, you choose to serve Him or serve yourself. It's the choice between prosperity and disaster. And hear me on this one. The choice we make determines the outcome. The choice we make determines the outcome. Not just for us, but for the people who come after us. Two short stories. Thursday night I went to Young Lives. You know how I feel about Young Lives. The guys took care of the kids while the moms Worked with the girls and did a Bible story and so forth. And these are the single moms at Kentwood Public High School. A number of our people were there. And I praise God for the people who were part of that Thursday night. Put together an awesome meal and so forth. When the meal was over, I went with a couple of other guys. And we sat and we started taking care of the kids. And there were some women in there as well. One of our women was holding a little boy. And I had watched this little boy grow for the last year and a half, and he's now walking. And this lady, one of our ladies, was holding him, and she set him down, and this little boy literally came like running to me with his arms open. And I put my arms out, and I scooped that kid up. And he just sat with his head on my shoulder for the rest of the night. Every time I put him down, he wanted to get right back up and just be held. 
And I looked at the guy who was sitting next to me and I said, you know what the tragedy of this is? Is this young boy has no man to hold him. No man in his life. Oh, he has a father. Anybody can be a father. But he needs a dad. And I thought, what a shame. What a shame this little boy has to go to bed every night without a dad to say goodnight. Some of you who are in that, as single parents, you know the pain of that. That hurts. It's choices. Life and death, not just for us, but for the generations that come. I just wanted to love that kid as long as I could. When his mom came to get him, I didn't really want to give him up. <laughs> Our choices are not about ourselves. When we make choices about ourselves, that's called selfish. We need to be selfless. The second one is yesterday morning I got a call. And I learned of a family that was splitting up. And the big issue was who's going to take the kids. Nothing wrenches my gut more than to have to deal with that. Some of you who are there know what I'm talking about. Do you understand what I'm saying when I say the choices we make don't just impact us? I plead with you when you are making choices, make good choices because it's not about you alone. It is about families. It is about everybody that comes behind you. Every choice we make is a life and death choice. It is about blessings and curses. Moses got it right when he says, choose life. Choose God. What am I asking you to do when you make choices? Make wise decisions. Proverbs says there's three kinds of people in this world. The first are the fools. Call them idiots. Who know better and still do what they please. That's selfish. That is selfish. Number two are kind of the ignorant or naive. Now they think, but eh, well, we'll see what happens. We'll make it work. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And the third are the wise. The wise look at choosing life. The wise seek out God's will. And I'm going to say whether you're a parent, and if you're, if you're a student or whether you're a parent, I'm going to encourage you to pick up a book. It's called Ask, Ask It. There's a life group. Some of our life groups are going to start studying it. It's written by Andy Stanley, but it is an awesome, awesome book. Parents, especially for kids, our kids are making life decisions by the time they're 15. They are choosing for what their life is going to look like by the time they're 15 years old. Do you see why I'm saying make wise choices? But pick up the book. It's an awesome book. I'll share more on that later. Choose God and choose life. The text says, Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. You make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and committing yourself firmly to him. This is the key for your life. The third one is, I'd like to end with that, but I've got to have one more. Good reform style has three points, right? The third one is this, share God. Remember God, choose God, share God, in that order. When you remember God, you're thinking about God, you can choose God. And if you choose God, you have to choose to share God. What you and I do today isn't just about us. It is about the next generation. This is why we do Orange at this church. We're passionate about the kids picking up the faith. This is why we do FX Saturdays in this church. We're passionate about the kids getting our faith. As I sat in my office thinking about this just a week after the Super Bowl, you can have the greatest quarterback out there, Aaron Rodgers, Nobody's going to go, boo. But what if there's nobody to catch the ball? What if he doesn't throw the ball? He can have all the skills in the world. He can have a whole team out there, but he doesn't throw the ball. What good is it? Isn't that kind of like us with our faith? 
We can have the greatest faith in the world. Oh, I believe. I will do everything uh, you command, Lord. But if we don't pass the ball, no one's going to catch it. Do you see why I say the decisions you and I make today impact everybody that comes behind us? What the text points out is to pass on our faith as if our lives and our children's lives depend on it. Because the reality is, it does. May you remember God. May you choose God. And may you choose to share God, to pass on your faith. Because when you do, you'll not only discover the key to life, but you'll experience strength for today. I don't know about you, but I could use more strength lots of days. I could use more hope. When you remember, choose, and pass it on, you'll find strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we want to give you thanks for this reminder this morning that you are God and we are not that we are to remember who you are and what you demand from us. Lord, belonging to you comes with a price, but a price that's well worth the cost because there are incredible blessings for obedience. Lord, help us to be obedient. Help us to be responsive to your calling. May we always remember you. Lord, I pray too that we would always choose you, that we would choose what honors you, what is not necessarily best for ourselves, but what is according to your will and what is best for those who come behind us. And Lord, as we grow in our faith and we trust and we see your goodness, help us to share with a boldness the faith that we claim to have. Lord, we just ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. people said. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite Dave to come up after the service if you have questions about Honduras. I also have a few members from our prayer team. If there's things God touched you and there's something you just want to share, maybe get it off your heart, have us pray for you. We want to make that available. Just come up here by the core value sign. We'll spend a little time. But otherwise, leave this place knowing that our awesome God, that bright hope for tomorrow, that strength for today comes from God the Father our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Go with the presence of the Holy Trinity. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.